Hello, everyone. I don't expect you to all say hello back. I realize you are all muted. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for Webinar Wednesday. We'll take off the weekly since we're doing this monthly now. Um, and I know most of you have joined us before, but just to make sure we're all saw on the same page, each webinar, even with the monthly series, is gonna be roughly an hour. We're gonna try to feature invited speakers from across the country to get you up-to-date information on helpful topics. And since it's a single hour, three of webinars total will equal one Master Dairy in-person meeting, since those are normally three hours, and these are three hours, these are one hour. And I do still need you to fill out a completion form to receive credit. It's the only way that I can, rec can record that credit for you. If you've already gotten your six hours that you need total for Master Dairy, maybe don't worry about it. Um, if you still wanna receive Master Dairy credit, go ahead and fill out that completion form. It's the same as the other completion forms. I'm just gonna add meetings as we go. If you know anyone who wants to record these or wanted to be here today and wasn't able to, we will have a recording posted to the UT Dairy website to view later, also for Master Dairy credit for anybody that needs it. For any agents I have on the line, if you have anyone that wanted to receive in-service credit for this but wasn't able to attend today, I'll also be posting those to Kate for in-service credit for later viewing. I think most of you have heard John talk before, but in case you haven't, John Winchell is a forage specialist with Alltech. I'm going to stop my share right now, who is joining us today to talk about the best ways to store your silage to maximize profits on your operation. Um, if you have any questions throughout, feel free to throw them in the chat and I'll relay them to John or unmute and we'll call on you or just use the raise your hand option um, underneath the participant screen. So lots of different ways to do it. And with that, John, I will turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Liz. I appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. There's a parlor in the background, so I, it, if you hear some clanging back and forth, then, that, then you know there's a parlor, and I apologize that well. And I thank you for having me, and if I, I apologize in advance, too, if you hear me coughing. I do not have coronavirus, but I do have a little bit of a allergy or respiratory thing or something, so I promise I won't infect anyone over the over the internet, but I will do what I can. Um, can I start my screen up here? Stop my video, no one needs to see me. Um, Liz, can you see? I can see your screen. You're not in PowerPoint mode yet, though yet. Is it there now? I can see your PowerPoint, but it's not in presentation mode. Oh, it isn't? Hmm. Mm -hmm. It is here. Huh. There you go. Okay. All right, we're okay now? We are perfect. All right, I appreciate it. And again, uh, my name is John Winchell. I live in Eden, New York. Um, been down to Tennessee a few times. Was actually supposed to be down in Tennessee here in two weeks, but with the, all this impending coronavirus, I am actually not allowed to go down. New York State has put a, uh, a restriction on Tennessee and uh, obviously other states as well. So I'm looking forward to coming back down and stopping at farms down there, but looks doesn't sound like it's going to be this month, but I will get down there as soon as I can. Um, topic I'm gonna talk about today, it, you could talk about this topic for hours. Each slide you could probably do a presentation on. So I'm going to give you kind of a 30,000 foot view of what I look for with silage storage and, and bunker management. Um, just some different things that I look at that I like to see and just some examples along the way and just maybe a little bit of education on how we can do things better as obviously corn silage is getting a little bit closer and some of these fall summers are probably about ready to go as well. So um, I would like to thank uh, the University of Tennessee and Liz for having me back again. I certainly appreciate the opportunity um, and we have a good partnership together and we work very well together. So um, I appreciate it. Um, 
But some of the key points that we're going to talk about today, I'm going to kind of hit on, uh, we're going to talk about correct harvest dry matter and maturity. We obviously want to get that pH down as fast as we can, whether it's in bunkers, silos, or bags. Uh, if we do have bunkers or piles, make sure our, we're going to have the correct tractor packing weight, which is probably one of the biggest things that I see as an issue for not having the correct bunker density is not having enough weight for the amount of tonnage that's coming into the bunker. Uh, obviously, that leads into the correct incoming silage ratio. You want to make sure you have enough tractor weight for the amount that is coming in for that bunker. Also inoculant usage, I know with the way the milk prices have been, some people have looked at trying to skip that, but I would say that that is something you definitely do not want to skimp on or skip because of we know that not everyone and not every single ton of silage that goes into our bags or bunkers is going to be perfect. So the inoculant is a very good insurance policy and does pay off well when you're utilizing an inoculant. Uh, sidewall management, we'll touch on that as well. Definitely putting plastic, plastic over the sides and that sidewall management is really critical to make sure that we are not losing dry matter loss on the sides of the bunker where I often, when I use my infrared camera, see a lot of that see a lot of wastage and a lot of wasted silage right on those edges. Um, adequate feed out, we wanna make sure we're getting enough feed out per day. And obviously the, the more your bunker is packed, the less you can take out, but in all reality, you're going to need to take between eight and 12 inches out on your face a day. And that sometimes can be difficult when you have really big faces. Uh, reduce secondary fermentation that goes along with the adequate feed out to make sure we're feeding out enough. Uh, have a location that is fit for a bunker. I can't tell you how many times I go to farms where you have to drive through a bunch of muck and manure and, and dirt and, and craters to try to get to that bunker. And anytime we have any kind of liquid in those bunkers and we're scraping up any feed, there's obviously room for enterobacteria or, or some sort of uh, clostridium or any other kind of bacteria. Um, and then this ties into it as well, make sure your pad conditions are good for the bunker or the bag. So you've probably seen this slide before if you've seen any of my talks. Um, to me, forage quality and obviously this talk today, bunk management is the last great dairy efficiency. I don't think I go to any dairies I'm on a 2,000 cow dairy in Connecticut right now, and I'm gonna look at the bunkers after this talk, and I'm assuming I'll probably find some opportunities because there's always a way to find some opportunities to, to find ways to, to improve what you're working on. I was at a farm up in Vermont, large dairy up in Vermont last week, and the dairyman said he's always done a good job with his bunkers and he's always taken pride in them, but then he took a trip to Germany to see the way they do it in Europe. And he came back invigorated saying that he had gotten into a lot of bad habits, even though he does a really good job with bunker management. He still says that he brought back a lot that he's going to change this year. And it really changed his, his view on things. And I would say that's one thing that we want to make sure we do get off of our own farms and kind of look and see what other people are doing. I know that different organizations and, and maybe even Tennessee will have, you know, some bunker days or something like that so that they can go around and take a look at things because I think that's very important to see. But when we look at things, it is going from bunk to bunk, from forage bunk, or in this picture, high moisture corn bunk, to the feed bunk is critical. We want to make sure that the forage we're putting in is fermented and is free of oxygen so that the pH can be low, so that it can be fermented, so that when we first start to feed these cows, we can make sure that they're getting the, the right amount of forages and actually the best quality that we can. And we wanna make sure that that translate what's going in is, what, is what's going out to the cows. And I definitely see that as an opportunity on a lot of farms. So something to keep an eye on. 
but with bunker silage and management, whether you have bags or silos or piles or, or bunkers, we want to make sure we're doing the best job we can to reduce the amount of loss that we can. The, the amount of loss on the average dairy is anywhere between 15 and 20 percent uh, between dry matter loss as well as quality loss. Um, you can see this picture of this bunker off to the side here to the right. You can see that yellow line across the bottom there. There's a little bit of an issue with fermentation on that bunker, but boy, you sure appreciate the, the face and how well maintained and manicured that face is. And then the oxygen barrier that's under it, it's been taken off where you didn't have too much plastic taken away. I don't like to see where you have a week's worth of silage exposed. You definitely don't want to do that. You want to have it as close as you can that's manageable. So just some things to work on. Here's a couple, couple pictures. Um, this is a dairy I went to in New York uh, that I was troubleshooting on. Obviously not the best scenario that you should look at. Um, I looked at this bunker when I pulled into the driveway and I said, oh boy, there's a, that's a tough one to get to. And he says, well, he says, I'm not using that bunker at the moment because he said the, uh, the mud is too deep and I can't get back to my silage. And he said, so I had to switch bunker. So hopefully this isn't a, anything that you have on, on your farms in Tennessee, but I do see these things from time and time from, uh, on occasion. So just something to definitely take a look at, but just kind of an example of what I do run into. This is the same dairy. This is the bunker that he switched to. And this is a picture of the feed and he was pulling off some of his silage waste but he did not cover his bunker. So this is all the feed that he's pulling off the bunker that looked bad to him. We all know that there is much more silage waste that we do not see and reduced dry matter and reduced energy, energy losses within this site, excuse me, within this silage. So this is definitely an example of, of a herd that's gonna be 25 to 30, maybe even more percent waste. You can see over top of this picture, there's a corn silage um, <coughs> pile right behind that. I was there in the, in the early spring and it was not covered. So obviously that's not the greatest situation either. So definitely some things to work on. This is another dairy that I went to in Ohio that um, said he had some struggles with um, with feed heating and some silage management issues and wasn't sure necessarily what was going on. But obviously, as you can look at the picture, there's some opportunities here to straighten things out. But as we saw that there are issues on certain farms and we all have these things that get away from us sometimes, there are beautiful examples of bunkers that are really manicured. And that's the term I like to use, are manicured and managed very well. This is a herd that I work with in New York that just started doing, that just built uh, a bunker a couple years ago and they really worked on bunker density. This is, this, this pile here is averaging about 18 pounds of uh, bunker density dry matter per square foot. Uh, does a pretty nice job with it. Uh, not much waste, does a good job with defacing. You can see the picture up to the top right with the oxygen, the oxygen barrier that's there. And then you can see how he just, how the tires are together and even and how he's barely pulling anything off of that. This is an interesting uh, picture. And then after this, I'll, keep, I'll move on. This is a dairy that I work with in New York. This is the best bunker density herd that I have run into um, since I've started doing this. Um, they were averaging 23 pounds of dry matter per foot per square foot of bunker density. The average in the U.S. is somewhere around 15 to 16 pounds of dry matter per bunker density. This guy, they were sitting at 23. If you look right behind in that top left picture where I have the, where it says 23 pounds, you could not take a pencil because I'll do something that I call a pencil test where I will take a pencil and try to stick a pencil into the bunker to try to see how far I can push the pencil. And that kind of gives you an idea, kind of a rough idea how well your bunker is packed. And I could barely get the pencil into this bunker and I could not pull any feed off with my hands. Now, if you notice, 
<coughs> excuse me, this is a very high producing herd in New York, but if you look to the top right picture, you can see there's a sidewall there that's really at a sharp angle and they can't deface the bunker at that side angle. They actually bring a payloader in to kind of to, to bucket it or scoop it out. So I have an infrared camera that I use quite a bit on farm. And if you look at the picture up to the left, the bottom left, you can see that green and blue and a little bit of yellow, but that shows that that bunker is really, really stable. That face is really stable, but then you see that bright red chunk that's right there on the right side of that bottom left picture. And then you look at the picture right to the right of that, and you can see all that waste. So you can see the huge difference between when they're using a defacer on a well-packed bunk, and then when you go in and gouge that and jut that out from that, because of that sidewall, you can definitely see the secondary fermentation. So those red, so that red and white, <laughs> excuse me, is definitely some secondary fermentation and some heating. So in this situation, he was feeding his, his low cows first, and he was going in and using the real nice, cool section of the bunker and then feeding the other way to the, to the higher cows. And after I showed this picture and I did this presentation for him, he said, you know, that's kind of a dumb thing that I'm doing. He said, I should be doing it the opposite way. And I said, yeah, you really should be. And I said, I figured you were. And he said, no. So what he ended up doing is going and, and using the well-defaced part for the high cows. And he did message me back and say that he did get some increased milk production on that high group by moving from this feed that was heating to that regular feed. So even herds that are doing a great job with bunker density there's always opportunity for something to, to tweak and something to look at. And, and it's, it's just look at it as opportunities. So we all use our sense of smell a lot and, and sometimes silage can smell wonderful, sometimes it can smell really bad, and sometimes it doesn't even smell at all. So to kind of talk about the different smells of silage, we don't hear about this too much. But normally when I see things in when things are going really well and the silage seems real stable and the bunk management is really good, typically that silage is almost going to have not much of a smell at all or maybe a tick of a sweet smell to it. Um, that, is a, that is a smell of a, of a silage that is fermented pretty well. Uh, then we run into some other smells. We run into these moldy smells. It's kind of a, a musty smell. Usually you run into that with some drier corn silage. It's just got that kind of what I would call a harvestor, a harvestor smell to it. Just has a little bit of that burnt, musty smell. And usually when that situation happens, you're running into drier corn silage and some yeast and mold count and potential for mycotoxins. <laughs> and that usually happens on these drier corn silages. Then sometimes we'll have an earthy smell. We'll see that at the bottom of bunkers a lot. Uh, this is typically when you have um, some bacillus problems or some clostridia problems who have a real high pH, which means it didn't ferment like it should, and then you have a lot of oxygen uh, permeation and, oxygen and uh, aerobic spoilage, and that burns up a lot of the feed. So when you have that earthy smell, the feed quality is not going to be what it says on paper. And usually, you're going to have an, a higher ash content in your forage sample as well. A few other smells real quick. You run into that vinegar smell, which is, a, like it says here, sharp odor. This is more from acetic acid levels. Think of, of that vinegar <coughs> smell. Usually these silages that have a high acetic acid really are not going to reheat. They're really pretty stable, and obviously acetic acid is a preservative. But when you smell this vinegar smell, sometimes you're going to have a little higher ammonia, then you can get to the point of having some ethanol and, and sometimes even a, a touch of butyric in there. And you'll see that, that yellow color, which is pretty indicative of the acetic acid. Usually you'll find that at the bottom of your bunker. You'll find that yellow, real deep yellow line like we had in the picture of that real nice bunker uh, face earlier in the presentation. But it'll usually have that deeper, darker yellow and quite a strong smell. 
Sometimes you'll have that uh, putrid, almost dead animal smell. That's usually from a clostridial issue where you had either, either some manure contamination or uh, some, a lot of high ash or, or mud mixed in and you get a butyric fermentation. More times than not, it's in grass silages and sometimes in legumes that were put up under 30% dry matter. These are really tricky silages to deal with. Um, a lot of times you're gonna have a lot of high dry matter loss and then you're also gonna have potential for ketosis with some of these feeds because you're just not gonna get the energy because that energy gets burned right out of it. Sometimes they'll have these tobacco smells, which is indicative of a high dry matter silage as well. And this is burned up protein, kinda I call that the harvester smell like I was talking about earlier. And then sometimes you'll get that real strong uh, nail polish smell, that acetate smell. You usually get that with a lot of ethanol, and that sometimes you're going to run into problems with intake and milk production, sometimes with butter fat, <coughs> and you could have some <coughs> rumen upsets as well. So when we look at shrink and we look at bunkers, we all know that the silage that we put in in the fall is definitely not look, gonna look like the silage that we're bringing out in the spring. So this is a good example of a bunker where you take a look at what I put in here in the red circles that shows how much shrink that we have had. This, this bunker in particular had a real low uh, bunker dry mat or uh, bunker density. So we were losing a lot of dry matter loss and fermentation loss as well. What I like to do is I like to check bunker densities uh, to take a look at some the bunkers just to kind of see how well we're doing and how well the stability on that bunker is. And doing bunker densities is something to definitely take a look at. And I do it in multiple locations of the bunk. Obviously at the bottom, you're gonna have the higher bunker density and the top, you're gonna have a little bit less of a bunker density. And then when you look at the sidewalls, this herd could have really utilized having some plastic on the sidewalls. This, this herd just had put in this bunker too, um, and they didn't think they needed to put in the sidewall, but you can see to that left up along the sidewall of that bunker where they did have some, um, some mold and some dry matter loss right at that side of that bunk. So really they did a pretty nice job with it. It could have been packed a little bit more, but there's some opportunities here as well. So. Why do we put silages in silos or bunkers or bags or piles? Well, it comes back down to fermentation. And fermentation, we do a lot of things with fermentation, whether it's, whether it's beer, whether it's, it's canned goods, whether it's silages, whether it's our cows, rumen and all that fermentation that goes on, that's probably the perfect fermentation vat that we run into. But when you talk to a lot of the old timers out there that, that we've dealt with for years, uh, and I remember this years ago when I first started doing nutrition, I had a farmer that told, that this isn't the farmer, but I had a guy tell me, he said, he said either good things happen or bad things happen. And I think that's really a pretty good way to look at fermentation, is with fermentation, you're either going to get a really good fermentation where you get a lot of this lactic acid production and you're going to get a lot of these good bugs where you take a, a sugar content that gets converted into lactic acid and you get that sudden drop in pH or sometimes you have the bad situation where you could have secondary fermentation with yeasts and molds. You could bring stuff in from the field with um, high butyric whether it's wet corn whether it's wet feed and clostridia or enterobacteria these bad bugs can proliferate. And especially if we have, for example, a wet spring where there's a lot of low sugar levels in halages and we, we harvested it a little bit wetter than we would like to, we know that halage ferments a little slower than corn silage anyways. It fights fermentation and it opens up the opportunity to have a lot, of more, lot more of these situations. So when we look at fermentation and we also look at inoculants too, we can look at um, a homofermentative or a front end fermentation, which is a lot of lactic acid, which drops that pH down real quick. When you have that happen, 
usually you can find it on your forage samples and not many people probably focus on the acid levels of their silage enough, but I would stress that we should take a look at those things whenever we get our silage samples back and just kind of take a look and sometimes that can help us along. But this front end, front end fermentation with the high lactic acid, Really, you don't get much dry matter loss or much energy loss. It usually keeps it pretty stable. Then sometimes you're going to have these Buchner eyes, which is a different inoculant. You're going to have these back-end uh, heterofermentative uh, reactions, which a lot of times are going to be a higher amount of acetic acid. You'll have less dry matter loss, and you won't have as much energy loss as well. Then there are some times when you run into these situations where we talked about that nail polish smell that you get when you get a lot of ethanol and alcohol production. And when you get that, you usually are going to run into problems. Production is not going to be where you want it. You usually have higher alcohol levels, more dry matter loss, and more energy loss, as you can see. But then when we start getting into these clostridial silages, these real wet, typically halages or, or or some of these small grains or, or alfalfas that are put in really wet, you can really have, as you can see, 51% dry matter loss, 18% energy loss. It's just a lot of problems. With yeast, the same thing. You're going to have a lot of dry matter loss. You won't have as much of an energy loss, but a lot of times you'll see that in your fat test. A lot of times in the summer, you'll see fat tests start to dip a little bit. We know there's a seasonality to the fat test, but also with some of these drier corn silages, if your fat test drops down to 3.1, 3.2, 3.0, .0, and your protein stays pretty much the same, then I would start checking my silage for wild yeast. Um, enterobacteria is just a really poor fermentation, a lot of energy loss, a lot of dry matter loss. And then sometimes when you have these high ammonia silages, you'll have um, biogenic amine production. Basically, it's the amino acids breaking down, and some of these amines are cadaverine, putrescine, and histamine. Cadaverine, you just hear that word and it doesn't sound good. So um, you'll find certain silages will be super high in ammonia that didn't ferment worth a darn. Um, so aerobic fermentation, you've probably heard that term before or read it in one of the magazines. Aerobic fermentation, that just means there's oxygen present. And when there's oxygen present, when we're trying to ferment forages, bad things will happen. We'll get fungal growth, we're gonna get molds, it'll slow fermentation down, we'll have a poor fermentation or a bad fermentation, and we'll also burn up energy as that, as that silage is slowly fermenting. And then once we get the anaerobic fermentation, that's after the lactic acid kicks in, we start to get that pH drop, the oxygen is out of there, and that's when you start to get fermentation like you should. And this is kind of just an ex example of what we're looking at with our silage. When we're packing, we go from an aerobic situation to an anaerobic situation to back to an aerobic situation when we're feeding out. So we want to make sure that it fermented the best and we're using a proper inoculant. If we know we have a huge face, we're going to want to make sure on our corn silage we're using a Buchner eye because that'll increase the acetic acid and the 1,2-propendiol, which will basically mean it's going to be stable more on the back end. A lot of these combination inoculants that have lactic acid, as well as Buchner eye and a couple other strains as well, do a good job of mixing that up together. This is kind of the same slide that we're looking at. We want to get rid of oxygen, then we want to convert that sugar into lactobacillus, which is going to lower the pH, turn that to lactic acid, and it's going to raise, <laughs> raise the acid in that silage. And once we get to that point of lowering the pH and raising the acid, a lot of these bad bacteria and, and, and bad things will not happen once you get there. Um, to look at a silage loss chart, I go to so many farms and we figure out their bunker density and look at their percent loss. And a lot of people say, there's no way I'm losing that much out of my bunkers. So this is a nice chart that, I, that, I, that I've seen in a couple different presentations where we talk about the processes of silage loss. So residual respiration, basically after you mow, say, your haylage, for example, 
um, or corn side, chop your corn silage, you're going to have respiration. You're going to have a specific amount of respiration is going to happen. You could take a silage sample that's real fresh and put it in a Ziploc bag maybe to give to your nutritionist. And if you do that and he comes there an hour later, you're going to see that water in that, in that Ziploc bag, and that's going to be some of that respiration. You're going to get 1% to 3% loss typically right there, and there's really not much you're going to do about respiration. Uh, fermentation, you're going to always get a little bit of loss during that fermentation process. Obviously, the goal is to re is increase the pH, or sorry, decrease the pH so that you can you can get that um, fermentation a little bit quicker, so you'll lose a little bit less. Affluent, um, that's obviously runoff in the bunker or making some too wet of silages. Controlling dry matter at harvest is super critical, and we'll talk about that in a second. But then you're going to you could potentially get five to seven percent loss there. You're going to have wilting losses no matter what you do, especially in your halages. Then we start to get what we can avoid. When you look at secondary fermentation, whether you're feeding off the bunk too big of a bunk, or what you're using, <laughs> or how much you're using, or the amount of cows, or you didn't pack that bunk enough, you're going to get that heating and secondary fermentation, which can open you up to yeast as well. Um, you'll get aerobic deterioration during, during silage. That is something that if you have the bunker packed or you take a little bit of time sealing that bunker off or you have a dry mat or your silage is going in too dry, you're going to have loss there. And that's one of the largest places that I see loss on farm is you're going to get this deterioration just because bunkers weren't packed enough or dry matter was too high on a lot of your forages. Um, then you're going to get this deterioration after storage, and this is what I was talking about earlier, um, issues with feed and face with bunker management, um, sidewalls, making sure you're doing enough with the sidewalls, and dry matter has a lot to do with this as well. So when you add this up, that could actually add up at maximum to 40% loss. And most people will say, oh, there's no way you could ever have 40% loss, but I could take you back to those pictures that we were looking at here earlier on some of the examples and say, I don't know, that's probably a pretty good and probably pretty close to 40 to 50% silage loss. One thing that I always look at is I wish that there was a, like the, the scale we have on our TMR mixer, I wish there was a scale on a bunker that could show how much was going in versus how much is going out. And I know a lot of people will keep track of dry matter by looking at the size of their bunker and then they will they will notch or take a, a, a tail chalk and mark and see how long it takes to go from panel to panel and that's a good way to take a look at that as well. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I am going to make it through, I promise. Silage losses with various management. There are certain situations when you don't have real good management you're going to have a lot of loss in that bunker, and that typically goes back to packing, packing and silage management, and also uh, feed out management as well. Then you're gonna have this middle section there where you can go either way, but it depends on, like I said, dry matter, bunker, or how that bunker's packed. Then you're going to have the goal, which is four plus five is nine, one is 10, 13, so, Anywhere between that 8 to 12% loss is really where you really want to make your goal for having bunkers. Um, piles are going to be a little bit harder because of the angles of those piles that you're going to be at and the height of those piles. Um, but in ag bags, you should be able to hit that, that 5 to 8% um, pretty easy in a bag, even though bags aren't packed super tight but they are covered and they are in a small area that gets fed out a lot. So to hit on harvest timing, to me, this is one of the most critical steps and you won't hear this much when people talk about um, bunker management, but harvest timing is so critical. It's so critical for the quality of silage, um, the digestibility of the silage, and it's also critical <coughs> for bunker management and making sure we can pack it. If you get it in too wet, you're going to have an affluent issue. Um, it'll pack nice, but you aren't going to typically get a good fermentation because 
under 30% dry matter, you're diluting those bugs. What you're doing is you have all that water, you're diluting the bugs down, and even if you're using an inoculant, you're not going to be able to use enough to offset all that extra uh, moisture that's in there. So you want to make sure you're above 30% dry matter, and I know we all have those issues where, where silage will get away from us, but really the goal is, is to try to make sure we're in that 33 to 38% dry matter range. Anytime we get above that 38 range, we're looking for trouble on packing and porosity and also feeding management with that as well because we can run into a lot of issues with heating and yeast and, and mold. <coughs> Excuse me. With this wet feed, obviously we talked about the affluent and the butyric acid, the amines, the ammonia, the excess ammonia that you're gonna have, just bad things happen when wet silage goes into a bunker. Um, Again, the other way, when you look at dry silage, you're going to have always issues with packing density and porosity. You're going to have a loss in feed quality. You're going to be able to chunk that feed out almost with your hand. It won't ferment well, and then you can really run into issues on the yeast and mycotoxin side. This is a chart that kind of shows up to the right, you have uh, bunker density, 10 kilograms, but then if you have off to the left here, you have dry matter percent, and then up towards the top left, you have dry matter loss. So obviously, as the dry matter of the silage goes up, you're going to have a lower bunk density, and you're going to have more dry matter loss. Those, those all go together. I've been talking about porosity. Porosity basically means the amount of liquid or gas that's going to be in between the, the particles of fiber or the forage that's there. If you have a dry silage, it's gonna be more porous. You can look at these, I think this test tube example is a real nice example because you can see with wet silage how much you can compress that and have a little bit of a density there. And then when you look at ones that are really high porosity, um, are drier silage that just, you have all that room for air and, and uh, potential for spoilage. So porosity, basically, there, there are numbers that you look at. You wanna basically keep that, uh, that porosity less than 40, than less than 40%. I use this on a lot of herds for bunker density work. I look at dry matter of the silage. I usually look at the dry matter density, the as-fed density, and then the porosity of the bunk. And usually what happens is, is carbon dioxide is produced in the bunk and oxygen will push upwards and heat the silage where carbon dioxide is heavier and it'll push down. Um, with dry silages, you can run into issues with effects of molds. Um, as this, this mold count shows on this chart, as the, as the silage gets drier, you have more dry matter loss and higher mold. Same thing when you look at the bottom with milk production, it's the same way. You run into these drier silages, you're going to lose milk production. Um, but when you look at this, you wonder, how much loss do I really have? Um, the average bunker, like I said, we're looking at that 10 to, I say 10 to 20% um, is the average shrink in a bunk. Um, Mold, mold and spoilage losses on these really good managed ones, you're going to have maybe 10%, but I, I'd say it's really hard to get it under 10%. Um, no matter how well you do, it's just tough to get it exactly right. Um, and then you're going to run into these issues. But for every inch of spoilage there, that used to be three inches of good silage. So you're losing a lot of that dry matter loss right there when you have a lower packing density and you have the opportunity for oxygen and secondary fermentation. This is a herd that I went on that when they were having some issues on farm with cows, their fat test was 2.6, which obviously fat test at 2.6 is not a money-making endeavor at all. But when you take a look at this, this was a wild yeast. Normally you don't see wild yeast in corn silage, but this was pretty glaring issue and the guy said he would clean the bunker off 
every single day and he would have that orange back every single day. And when we looked at the mold count on this silage, it was too numerous to count. Um, he had to deal with this issue all year long and it really was a tough thing to go through. So this is a fermentation chart. I'm sorry, it's such a busy chart, but this is something that I think everybody should have and, and we should all talk with our nutritionists or consultants about because this is taken actually from Dairyland um, Labs up in Wisconsin. It shows the pH, the lactic, the acetic acid, propyteric. Shows the different fermentation for different silages, whether it's an alfalfa silage or grass silages or corn silage or high moisture corn. Some things to note that you want to make sure that your pHs on your haylages are going to be higher than your pHs on corn silage because haylages are, have more buffering potential and they are not gonna lower the pH. So really, when I, I always suggest to use an inoculant on your haylage because haylage is gonna fight fermentation as it is. So lactic acid is the second one there. I really like looking at lactic acid. You wanna make sure on your silages, if it fermented very well, you're going to have a higher lactic acid content. On some of these silages where you're using buchneri for your um, high moisture corn or corn silage and sometimes haylage, you're going to have a higher acetic acid number than sometimes what is shown here is the averages that you're going to run into. And then the, the probiotic acid I don't look at too much and then I also look at butyric, but normally if, unless it's a really wet silage you don't run into butyric. And then if you start running into these ethanols, methanols, and these propendiols, those are typically not a good situation because that means you have dry silage with that nail polish smell and secondary fermentation. And then you look at the ammonia levels. If Look at the ammonia level on your silage and that will tell you one of the reasons of how well it fermented. And then you can look at the lactic acid ratios and the percent of lactic acid. Um, this is a herd that is a high producing herd that I, that I work with. Um, obviously it's in a northern climate. Uh, if you look at the bunker to your picture to your left, you would say, yeah, they're doing a decent job with their bunker, um, keeping it faced, and, and it was actually packed pretty well. Um, the, you could see some heating in this bunker a little bit, um, but when you look at this haylage sample, it came back at 21% protein. Um, it was an alfalfa mix. 20, 30, 40 is what a lot of people look for for quality haylage. The crude protein is 21, 9, 37, 49. And with a, with a mix like that, that's kind of what you would expect for a higher quality feed. But this guy was having massive um, twist issues, massive retained placentas, uh, huge ketosis issues, and cows crashing like crazy and a lot of twists and couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, so I, we looked at this haylage. This was a unique silo because that haylage bunker right there was at the bottom of four tiers of bunkers. You had the corn silage up top, a high moisture little bunk, and then you had a haylage bunk above and this haylage bunk down here. And you can't see from the picture real well, but when you go, went in there, there was probably two or three inches of nasty standing affluent and water in there. And if you look at the sample again, 25% dry matter. So it was made wet, but still the numbers on paper look good. But when you look at the sugar levels, which are almost non-existent and the ammonia level at 44.7, when you only want to be about 12% of crude protein, that shows that something really went wrong. And then when you do a fermentation analysis, if you have questions on if your inoculant's working or not, I would suggest to take a fermentation analysis of your forage. It's a more in-depth look. Uh, for this haylage, it was wet, the pH was bad, the ammonia was high, the lactic acid percent is normally 50 to 88% of the acids are gonna be lactic acid. If you look at this, it's 0.67. So there was virtually no lactic acid. This stuff did not ferment at all. And when you look at the lactic acid and the VFA levels down below, it's pretty brutal. You do see a super high acetic acid, as we do see sometimes 
in these wet halogens because that's indicative of a real slow fermentation. But you can see the butyric at 5%, and you look over to the right, 0.2 to 1.5 is, is the observed range, and this is at 5. This is the kind of silage that I actually tied to the top of my truck because it stunk so, so bad that I didn't want to wear that feed and have my truck smell. So this is one of those rare ones where as soon as you touch the silage or you get it all over your clothes and you go in the house and you want to change clothes right away. Um, looking at harvest dry matter again real quick, um, you want to chip your corn silage to make sure you're getting the adequate dry matter you can. You want to make sure you're processing your corn silage the best that you can to make sure we're reducing that fecal starch and to make sure you're getting your packer, packing density up to snuff. Uh, this was a chart that's been used for years and years and years. It shows to the left the silage bunker density, to the right it shows the dry matter loss. So if you have a 10 pound of dry matter uh, per square foot, at, if, it's, if your bunker density is 10, your dry matter loss is 20, at 14 to 15, where the average herds are at, you're going to have that 15 to 16% loss. And then if you can get into that 18 to 20 range, that is where you want to go. That is a sweet spot. That typically means that you have enough tractor weight and you're moderating. You put a governor on those, those wagons coming into the bunker. But the key to packing is you want to make sure, obviously, you have enough tractor weight to manage those bunkers. And you want to make sure that the flow coming in is under control as well. And there's different things that we can do. Um, you can use these sheep's foot that I've seen with some of these guys that have worked with construction, that have some construction friends that might have a sheep's foot sitting around. They're very heavy and they do a good job. You don't see them too often, but they're really, really nice to use. These silage packers do a real nice job. <laughs> I've been very happy with them. Skinny tires, I like the utilization of these skinny weighted tires on some of these tractors, especially when you look at packing sidewalls. One thing you can do to make sure your sidewalls are packed that far, that eight or three feet from the edge of the bunker, is using single tired tractors or skinny tires right along that bunker, because we know if we're using duals, it's very hard to get that pressure out at the edge of the tractor. Most of the storage loss is typically going to be in that top section. And obviously, we talked about the weight of the bunker is really huge. Um, so you're not going to get a lot of loss typically in the middle, but you're going to get it in this top spot of the bunk. This is some work that was done a few years ago that, where they fed top spoilage. And the more you fed to cows, the less the dry matter intake was. And then obviously, the lower the digestibility of that forage was as well. So milk production crashes the more of this top spoilage that you're feeding. Um, putting bunker covers on, I see some of these, these green covers that you run into. Uh, obviously, the, the two, two plies of plastic, whether it's an oxygen barrier, which I overly suggest, um, as well as putting another, white, another plastic cover on and tire to tire cover. I see this too many times where I see it was kind of covered, but kind of not. And more often than not, you're going to see spoilage. And especially if you're using an oxygen barrier, you want to make sure you have tire-to-tire -tire coverage so we don't have that oxygen barrier lifting up. Looking at faces, obviously you can use rakes. You can use uh, defacers. Um, a lot of guys still use buckets. Buckets are really hard because you scoop and chunk into the, the, the silos or the bunkers and you actually lift up and allow oxygen to go in and create secondary fermentation. There are some people that can do a real good job with, with buckets by going sideways and dragging with their buckets, but really defacers and, and rakes are kind of the best way to go. Uh, this is just a picture of um, a bunker that wasn't packed really well and wasn't really level on top and a lot of water got in and you'll see this Red lot, this red here is secondary fermentation from water. Facing equipment, we just talked about that, the differences between shavers and rakes and buckets. I would suggest definitely using an inoculant, whether it's a combination inoculant or on your, on your uh, high moisture corn, corn silages, to use a 
uh, a hetero fermentative or hetero lactic inoculant like a Buchneri, it definitely will pay. And this is a meta analysis that shows that you're definitely going to increase the stability of the silage by using an inoculant, and especially on that side with a Buchneri inoculant. So if you have a huge bunker face or a pile face, you're definitely going to want to use a, a, a Buchneri form of inoculant. Uh, this is just a, an example of what we do or what I do for, with Alltech on bunker densities to do bunker audits on farms, just to look at the percent loss so you have an idea where you're at. There's some really good spreadsheets from University of Wisconsin on bunker densities. Um, and then as we go, there's some cards. This is a card from Cornell that shows packing weight guidelines by tractor and delivery rates. Um, these are really nice, and I would suggest that this would be a good thing to have to give out to customers. So finally, this breaks it down to <laughs> some of John's big rules. Um, there's the 800 pound rule. When I look at this rule, it's 800 times the amount of tons per hour chopped that needs to equal the tractor weight that you have in that bunker. So 800, say you're bringing in 125 tons per hour, multiply that times 800, that's 100,000 pounds of tractor that you need on that bunk continuously to pack. So you see these two tractors in front of me. This tractor has a blade on it. You want to take a bladed tractor, and due to the down pressure and a lot of times that it's being off the bunker and not continuously on the bunker and also that down pressure, you will want to take that tractor weight and divide it by half. So you want to make sure you have enough tractor weight on those bunkers. Um, there's another way to look at it, to, to looking at the amount of acres per day you're putting in and the amount of tons you're chopping. You can look at it that way too. The 800 method seems to work well for me, but that's, you know, you can use whatever method you're using as long as you make sure you have enough on there. Um, the six inch rule, you want your layers to be no more than six inches. <coughs> Any more than that, you're going to be digging in, you're going to have some issues. Your best, and you will get your best packing if you're using that six inches. So no more than six inches at a time. Obviously, another John Winchell must is cover your sidewalls. Uh, really, really reduces that side spoilage by covering your sidewalls. And also oxygen barriers are something I think are, are a must as well. So to finish up, uh, we're looking at harvest at the correct dry matter, use an inoculant, oxygen barriers. I don't sell them, but man, are they, do they work well on farms. If they're applied right, I know they're a pain to put on, but you could feed almost pretty much every bit of silage in those bunkers with a nicely applied oxygen barrier and tire to tire coverage. Use a proven plastic. I know there's a lot of plastic suppliers out there. Just make sure you're using a proven plastic and the mill, the mill level is right. And you're not, if it's typically half the price of everybody else's plastic, I would not go with that. Because you want to make sure, because this silage is 12 to 18 months that you're going to run into for the next uh, length of time. Six inch layers at max, seal it as quick as you can, cover tire to tire, cover the sidewalls, know your tractor weight, know your tons per hour coming in. Those two are so critical in packing, and those are one of the biggest things that I run into, especially on herds that have custom harvesters that want to just get it in and get it gone. And then at the end of this, you'll see have a quarterback. You need to make sure that you have a quarterback in that packing tractor that can slow people down or can radio to people to make sure that it's not getting away from you. Because I've seen so many times where there's four trucks and three trucks waiting and they just dump feed and go. But you have to have a quarterback to be in charge because I know how crazy of a time this is when you're doing when you're doing bunkers and packing and, and going. One last thing I think as the future comes, we're starting to track bunker inventory with drones. I think it's a pretty cool technology. Alltech has some people that can do this for you where we can actually take a drone. We have to get a pilot's license and we will go in and we will 
take and fly over your farm using the, the grid and GPS coordinates, and you will actually type in the dimensions of the bunk, and the drone will actually report how many tons are in that bunker if you have dry matters and you have um, the dimensions of that bunker, but it figures out the dimensions for you, but you will have a pretty good idea on the footprint. So this is kind of some of the things that are happening in the future. Um, I want to thank Liz and University of Tennessee for allowing me the time to talk, and sorry if I rambled a little bit, and if you hear the parlor noise was a little bit much of a background, I apologize, but um, thank you for your time. Um, Liz, still with me? I'm still with you. Thank you so much for your presentation, John. Great information as always. I know we're getting pretty close to the end of our hour, yep. y'all, and John is actively on a farm, but John, do you have time for a couple questions? I, I for sure do. Yep. Always for you. Guys, if y'all have any questions, throw them in the chat or unmute or throw up a hand. I know I went through a ton of stuff in, in 50 minutes. <coughs> well, I've got one for you while the others think about if they have a question for you or not. Yep. I was recently asked, what is the best type of silage inoculant to put in with my silage? Because there's so many different companies, so many different kinds out there. How do I know what kind of inoculant I need to use in my silage? That's a great question. Um, there are not a lot of companies out there that make inoculants. You want to make sure that the inoculant you're using is from one of those proven companies that has research backing their inoculant. Anybody can make an inoculant in their garage pretty much and call it an inoculant and throw some bugs in there. There's bugs that you can look at, some lactobacillus bugs that you can get from China and you can put them in, but that doesn't mean they're viable bugs. Um, so <laughs> Sorry. So I would say definitely use a company that has research behind it, use a proven inoculant, and then for sure use a lactobacillus type or a combination of lactobacillus um, and, and then also a buchneri on corn silage or high moisture corn and they now have combination ones, and now there's a new lactobacillus brevis out there that's kind of a back-end inoculant. Um, but one of the things I would suggest, if you have five companies trying to sell you inoculant, I would not buy the cheapest one. And everybody's instinct is to probably do that, but there are times when I've looked at different inoculants and you look at the, the amount of CFUs that are in it, and the CFU game is really a tricky game because the, you can write anything on your CFUs and depending on the colony, colony forming units that you're working on, you can have different ranges. And so definitely make sure that it's a reputable company and that it is something that you can trust and make sure that you ask them if it needs to be, how it needs to be stored needs to be stored in a refrigerator typically. Normally, if they say it doesn't need to be stored in a refrigerator, you just leave it in a cool environment somewhere in the office. I don't really know if I would trust that situation at all. Thanks, John. We have a couple that came in through the chat. The first one is, what's the difference between using tires versus the green armor for covering the plastic? And which do you prefer? <laughs> Well, the easy met the easy answer is cost. <laughs> um, so, this is an analogy. Um, this is a Game of Thrones analogy, or or one of those type of anal a medieval type of analogy. Um, but if you've ever messed with that green, that those green covers, they're great and they really do a good job. They seem to last for a few years, as long as you're careful with them. But they are super heavy. They are almost like um, putting some of that chain armor that those medieval knights would throw on themselves. It just, it's got that real heavy, bulky feel to it, um, and it really sets it down, really does a nice job where you don't have wind damage. It's a lot easier than having tires. Um, 
when you have your, your cut tires, you have less water, but I know there's a lot of farms that have half tires or you have a lot of water and slop. Sometimes people don't like dealing with tires just because they are nasty and a pain in the butt to do, but tires are a lot cheaper than those green things. I think that those green uh, covers are <laughs> probably do a better job, but there is a significant cost there. And really, if you're concerned about it and you aren't doing a good job with the tires and your employees don't like handling it, then maybe looking at that green cover is probably a better option. But definitely cost, but I think they probably do a little better than tires. But if you're covering your tires from tire to tire, I still think you can do a good job. Thanks. What, next question is, do you have any tips to keep wildlife and birds off of bunkers and bags? Huh. Um, I've seen people do a lot of weird things. Um, I don't suggest putting poison on bunkers. I've seen people try to do that before. Um, it's not necessarily obviously a good idea. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough question. I really don't have a good answer really have a good answer for it. Um, it's really hard to do. Some places are worse than others. I, I noticed that I have a lot of guys that would put piles out in fields and they obviously have a lot more risk of, uh, of wildlife damage um, than what bunkers right by the barns do, but you still will get that as well. I, I really don't have a good answer for that. And I'm just being honest. I don't have a real good I'd love to hear if anybody has a real good answer besides a shotgun and some shells. Um, I would love to have a, hear a good answer. So we had a farm dog, but he seemed to cause just as much bag damage by chasing things <laughs> off of the top of the bags. I don't know that that was the best solution. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I know I've seen people. I've had guys swear by shooting crows. Um, and putting them on, setting them on a bag or a bunker, but I, I guess I, I can't say that that's, uh, it, it's a, it is a problem in some farms, it's worse than others. So any idea when you're going to be able to come back to Tennessee after your travel ban? Well, I, it was, it was, it was down to the wire. I was sure I was going to come down for a, for a week and see some of the herds that I've seen before down in Tennessee. Um, and, and also see some new ones. But yeah, as long as, until Tennessee's um, COVID numbers start to go on the decrease, um, our governor, that's basically the New York State, has said that it's a $10,000 fine if you're, if you're caught coming from, I don't know how they're gonna know, but if, they're, if you're caught coming from another state, um, it's a $10,000 fine and there's like, the states all the way through the south and out west and Iowa and then also Tennessee, unfortunately. So I don't know. We'll see. Any more questions for John before we let him get back to his farm visit? All right, it's looking pretty quiet. So just as a reminder, y'all, if you would like master dairy credit for this, please, please go and fill out the completion form. That is the only way I can count y'all to know that you were here today because thank goodness a lot of you have been on, so that's great. Um, if you have someone who's gonna wanna go back and view this recording, it will be available on, master, on UT Dairy, uh, probably by the end of the day to our YouTube channel. Um, and just another aside for those of you dairy farmers who are still on, I'll send out an email about it later and I'll talk to all of your agents as well. The Milk Quality Initiative money will be available this year starting probably in October, but it is going to be available as part of TAEP application. So it will not be a standalone program this year. John, I know that has nothing to do with you, but wanted to throw that out there no, that's fine. for the interested farmers. So as we get more information on that, um, I'll be sending out updates. I'm sure you'll get some through TDA as well as that keeps going, but that program will be in place this year. Hey, Liz, quick question. Um, I know we're running over now, sorry. Um, are, is corn tasseling yet down in Tennessee? 
I think it probably depends on which part of Tennessee we're in. I know some guys got corn in really <laughs> late this year because we had a whole lot of rain. Yep. Um, so some places I've seen it still only looks like about a foot tall, and some places might be tasseling. Yeah, and I have those southern guys. Chime those. In. <laughs> but the reason I ask is because I want to just make sure to remind everybody to write down on your calendars when you tassel, um, because that's kind of the halfway point, and you can use grow and degree days and and utilize um, some different online programs to help you with your your corn silage harvest. And by knowing that tassel date. That's really important part of that puzzle. So, thanks, John. All right, I'm not seeing any more comments in the chat. I don't see anybody raising their hand or unmuting. So, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate you you taking time out for us, Tennessee guys, to talk about forages. No problem. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday, and we'll see you later. <laughs>